what happened between Matthew and Malachi? What happened between, no, what happened between Malachi, well, you can go the either direction, you know, you can go either way. What happened between Malachi and Matthew? All right, we'll, we'll go that direction, that's fine. Uh, and we're going to look at that tonight. There's a lot to cover. There's a 400-year gap between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New. So we're going to try to cover 400 years in about 20, 25 minutes. Uh, it's not going to happen, but we'll do our best. So anyway, let's have a word of prayer and we'll look to this tonight. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here tonight. I pray that you'd uplift us, that you'd give us joy in our hearts, and that you'd help us now to find something helpful and applicable that will uh, make us better students of the Scripture and will uh, help us to understand uh, really how you are in control of all things and all times and all places and all kings in the earth. Help us to realize those things as a result of our study here tonight, and we thank you for it. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we have, th this is a doctrinally, you know, in seminary or whatever, they call this the intertestamental period. Anybody hear of it called that? It's called the intertestamental period. You know why they call that? Because you have the Old Testament and the New Testament, and in between is the interperiod. It's the intertestament period. And uh, when you look at Scripture, you know, a lot of times some of us get lulled into the misconception that when we begin at Genesis, you know, the first words are in the beginning, right? Talks about all that happened in the beginning. And we turn to Revelation, we look at it and we see, okay, Revelation is all about what happens in the end. And so that means everything in between must be all lined up nice and neat chronologically for us. But we would be wrong if we thought that. In fact, the, 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 the beginning and the end books might be kind of in alignment, but the rest of them are pretty much out of order. Uh, however, the, between Malachi, Malachi was one of the last, uh, last prophets to write in the Old Testament uh, chronologically. And, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels were all written contemporaneously uh, at the same time in the New Testament. Uh, but they weren't necessarily the, the, the only books. The, 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 around the same time of Malachi, in fact, a contemporary of his was Nehemiah. And Nehemiah, was, of course, was known for rebuilding the wall, coming back and allowing a remnant of the Jews to come back. Nehemiah was around the same time as Malachi. And Ezra, the book of Ezra, was written in roughly the same time period as well. They were all uh, within, within uh, 50 years of each other or so. And so we have those, those three books that all tell us towards the end of the Old Testament. Uh, they were the, the last writers of it. But let's, before we can really understand what happened in this time period, we have to kind of review a little bit of history. Uh, where were the Jews at the close of the Old Testament? Well, we know that, let's back up even further, we know the Jews had their kingdom, they had the land of Israel, it was established under King Saul, then David, then Solomon, and then the kingdom split. Okay, we're just 10,000 foot view here, right? The kingdom split into two halves. We had the northern kingdom, they had their own king, and then we had the southern kingdom of Judea. And we had both of these now had their own sets of kings. They both kingdoms began to, time after time, fall back into sin, fall back away from God, fall further and further away, eventually God enacts his judgment against the northern kingdom. They were taken into captivity, and they were no more. But the southern kingdom continues on for uh, a little while longer, and eventually they were all taken into captivity as well, or most of the people. Uh, so what we have at the end of the Old Testament, really, is a time period where um, both kingdoms had been basically taken apart. They had been conquered. There were still a remnant of people that, that were left in the land of Israel, but many of the Jews were taken off to other parts. Think of the book of Daniel, who is, remember, he was taken as a young boy, taken off to be a, a, uh, a prodigy, a, a student of the uh, kingdom that he was under there with Babylon and, and then into Persia, the Persian Empire. And, um, and there were others. And then, of course, we see Nehemiah. He stands up. He was a cupbearer to the king. And uh, the, the, the king says, okay, Nehemiah, you may go back and rebuild Jerusalem. You know, if that bothers you so much, he, he gave him that opportunity. And the book of Nehemiah talks about how Nehemiah leads a remnant back and they begin to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem 
And, um, but at the same time, this, this nation's still conquered. It's still very much um, under the control of, at this point, the, the Persian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. And I uh, just want to talk historically what happens at this point in time. The Old Testament leaves off, you know, what goes on at this point in time? Well, historically, as far as the Jewish people were concerned, they left off, they were still under the control of the Persian Empire. By the time the New Testament opens up, who are they under the control of? The Romans. So somehow between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew, the Jews were dominated, the Persians, now they're dominated by the Romans. Well, that wasn't just a simple handoff. In fact, it was a very big time of confusion. The Persian era, this era that the Persians uh, were, were uh, in, in power and dominated, uh, it began, uh, like I say, clear back to the book of Daniel. Uh, and we see it then, then continue for about 100 years until we see the end of the, uh, the Old Testament. And uh, the Persians conquered Babylon in 536 B.C. So the Babylonian Empire fell to the Medo-Persians. And then it continued on into this period for about another hundred years after, uh, after the end of, ba- of Malachi. Towards the, uh, the end of, of this period, Judea continued to be a territory of Persia. And it was under their governor. But at the same time, they allowed a certain measure of civil authority. They allowed a certain measure of self-governance. That's why Nehemiah was allowed to go back, and there were others after him that were allowed to have a certain amount of self-governance under the auspices of the Persians' rule. Uh, The Jewish people that were there, the remnant that were left, they were allowed to observe uh, some of their religious tenets that they would have, and the the government of Persia didn't interfere to to a large extent. Um, they, had, they had taken the Jews, they had, um, they had conquered them, and for about the next hundred years, um, they continued to be in control. This was all changed very quickly in 336 B.C., when a man who jumped off of the pages of history, and we've all learned about it at some point in time, uh, leapt onto the, 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 the historical scene, and his name was Alexander the, Alexander the Great. And if there was one man who probably did more to change the world, it was Alexander the Great. And he, beginning around 330, 334 B.C., began his conquest of the the known world uh, at the time. And, of course, throughout his conquests, he, in, in a matter of 13 years, Alexander the Great started at a very young age, and in a matter of 13 years, he had conquered really the extent of all of the known world at the time. He was basically, became a superpower. Greece, that he was behind, the Greek Empire, it became a superpower in the, in the short time period of 13 years that Alexander the Great did this. And he defeated uh, the Persian king Darius, who we hear about uh, in, in different uh, references, and he gave him control of the Persian em- Empire and therefore gave him control of the land of Israel as well. And under his influence, as I said, he's very influential because what does he do? He comes in and the entire world begins to speak and learn the Greek language. This is, uh, and they began to learn Greek culture. What he came and brought with him was not, oh, you can be your own people anymore. No, he, his mission was to have one world that spoke Greek, that loved Greek, that loved the Greek culture, that loved the Greek gods, that was, he wanted to turn everybody into Greek converts. And uh, the the funny thing was, most of the world didn't resent him for this. Why did that happen? We don't know. Uh, The the process you'll see in the secular history books, it's known as the Hellenization because of of the the, the, um, adoption of Greek culture. It was called Hellenization. And it became so popular Uh, even in people that were conquered, that even up until through the Roman era uh, and New Testament times, there was still this pervasive Greek language that was known. Greek thought had permeated the the minds of people who had never experienced it before. And in just a very, very short period of time, people who had never spoken Greek before or never heard of Greece began to speak Greece. They became bilingual in a very short amount of time. 
It's nothing short of miraculous, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't too long. Like I say, Alexander only, he only, he died at the age of 33, and uh, he was just getting himself started, as it seems, before he died, not in battle, but due to an illness. And, uh, and when he died, he had four generals underneath him that split up his empire into four chunks. And, uh, and this was the next era. It was, goes from the Greek era uh, and what we call, it, what's called officially the Egyptian era, era because one of those generals uh, became the head of uh, the Egyptian area. And, uh, and because Egypt is so close to Israel, they very soon took over the land of Israel and dominated that country. Um, but in the, means, in, the, in the midst of all this, like I say, the Greek influence, the Greek thought continued to infiltrate the culture of the Jews. And this is important for a number of reasons we're going to talk about in a minute. Because during this period, uh, there was almost this unnoticed change in culture. The Jews didn't begin to think like Jews anymore. They began to think and act more like Greeks. It was, became a part of who they were. And Jewish worship was influenced to become more external than internal. God wanted their worship of their hearts. It became more of just a ritual, more of a formality for them during this period. Jewish worship became less about a heartfelt worship of God, but more just a, another God that we go through the motions with. Uh, two, the, the other thing that's important here, and we're going to talk about this in a minute, during this period there were two parties that began to emerge. We hear about them often in the New Testament. And the, the very beginnings of them start during this period. They're known as the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees, right? These two groups began to develop. You know why they begin to develop? Because the Sadducees were very much, there was a group of people who said, we believe in having religion and we believe in the Bible to a certain extent, but really we're heavily influenced by Greek culture and we really want to be wealthy well to do, we, we really respect what the Greeks do and what they're all about. And the Sadducees kind of came from a group of people that believed that. The Pharisees developed out of a group that they thought this is, um, this is no good. We can't allow Greek thought to enter what we're, what we're doing. And we're going to do everything we can to set up barriers and walls and writings to make sure that we don't allow Greek, the Greek culture to infiltrate who, we're, who we are. Uh, we're going to be what you might call the orthodox ones. Um, the, um, they were the predecessors to these Pharisees that we see come out in the New Testament. And these two groups began to, grant, to gain their own strength and their own momentum, almost like two political parties, you know, always at war with each other. They were still at war with each other by Jesus' day. Uh, and this is where they were at. This was the Egyptian era. Well, it wasn't too long after that. This, is, this, was, this lasted for about another hundred or so years uh, until another ruler came along. He was another predecessor, another successor to another one of the, the kingdoms that were split up. Uh, under Sirius, there was a man by the name of Antiochus III or Antiochus the Great. And he was from Syria. He came down in 198 B.C., just 200 years before the birth of Christ. And he... Um, he captured the land of Israel, took control of it, and governed it from Syria. Now, until this point in time, the Jews were pretty much allowed to worship how they wanted and live how they wanted. But under this Antiochus the Great and then some of his successors, uh, the Jews began to be treated very harshly. Uh, they were allowed to maintain some local rule, and they were, they were, this was all to be ruled by what the, the ruling party called the high priest. Of course, the high priest was supposed to have some say, right? Well, the way it, it, very, it became a very political office, the high priest's office. And as you might remember, by the time Jesus' day came, who was the high priest? How was he functioning? Very much as a political entity and a puppet, in a way, with the, with the Roman Empire. This is where it all got started. The high priest became uh, someone who was a political uh, you know, marionette, if you will, <laughs> that was operated on behalf of the, uh, the, 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 the governing uh, uh, country, in this case, Syria. Uh, it all went well until this party that became the Sadducees eventually, who liked Greek, Greek culture, they had someone who they thought should be the high priest. 
And they put him up and said, this is the guy. Let him be the high priest. Let him govern the country. The problem was there was another group who ultimately became the Pharisees, and they said, hey, he's not orthodox. He's not the right guy for us. And uh, they said, we don't want anything to do with this. So you know what the Sadducees did? They did what any good political party did. They went and gave, they went and gave the authorities a bribe. <laughs> And they said, you put our guy in office, you let him be the high priest, and we'll, we'll make sure that, you know, everything's well. And uh, they, slipped the, they slipped the government a 20 or whatever, or a 20,000, I don't know what they gave them. And, uh, and so they put him in power. Well, the next thing you know, it, unrest took place. You can imagine what took place on the ground there in Israel. Pharisees were upset, the people were upset, there was a lot of turmoil and Antiochus, who was now Antiochus Epiphanes, he was the third or fourth in line after this, he came down and he said, basically, this is my paraphrase, this is enough, kids. <laughs> We're putting this thing to an end. And he said, if this is how you're going to be with this high priest stuff, he says, we're just going to get rid of all the religion. And so he came down in 168 B.C. because of all this inner fighting amongst the Jews over this high priest deal, he began to outlaw everything about the Jewish faith. He outlawed all the sacrifices, the rite of circumcision. He outlawed the observance of the Sabbath, the offering of sacrifice. He disallowed the celebration of feast days. He mutilated and destroyed nearly every copy of the Hebrew Bible. Jews were forced to eat pork and to make sacrifices to idols. And as his final act of sacrilege, he went... Um, he went into the most holy place in the temple and he built an offer, he built an altar and offered a sacrifice to the god Zeus, the great Greek god Zeus. And of course, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. And this is what caused the great uprising and the great rebellion amongst the Jews in this period. This was roughly 165 BC. Antiochus. Epiphanes, as he was be known, uh, came and did this terrible, harsh treatment of the Jews. And, um, and so about this time, we have some real priests. They were, they were actual priests that were descended from the priests, from the Levites, uh, by the name of um, the Maccabees. The last name was Maccabees. And an elderly priest by the name of Mattathias Maccabees lived with five sons in his village just north of Jerusalem. And when all of these things happened, he began to lead an uprising against this Syrian king and all that he had done. And in the midst of all of this, um, through this great revolt and this great time of, of upheaval, he was successful at pushing this, this king back out and, uh, and basically taking control of the country. This is known as the Maccabean era. And there were thousands of Jews that joined together with him. They, uh, they revolted, and uh, he and his sons eventually, through the course of a number of years, eventually uh, they retook Jerusalem, they cleansed the temple, they restored biblical worship, and at the rededication of the temple, after all of this was done, they lit a menorah, which you'd know in Jewish today, today, when do they light the menorah? Anybody know? Anybody know about Jewish culture today? When is it? Around Christmas time. Yep, it is. It, what's the name of the holiday they celebrate? Hanukkah. Hanukkah. This, was the, this was the beginnings of Hanukkah. When the Maccabees came and the, they, up, they, up, they revolted, they pushed the ruling parties out, they regained control of their country for just a little while, and in the course of the rededication of the temple, the story goes, they only had enough oil to light this for one day. And miraculously, there was enough oil in their, in their lampstand to last for eight days, which is why Hanukkah lasts for eight days. And, uh, and so that's the story as it goes. Whether it's all true or not, we don't know. But nonetheless, we do know that they did gain control. And it was uh, Hanukkah that was born out of this, uh, this occasion. And so, um, again, the Pharisees continue to rise in power. The Sadducees, even through this time, they continued to struggle for control. But this was uh, short-lived because um, this, this lasted for less than 100 years. 
when the Romans began, began to be on the march. And 63 B.C., this was about 60 years before Christ, the, uh, the Maccabees had no, no able, ability to resist against the Roman armies that marched against them. A Roman general by the name of Pompey conquered Syria, entered Israel, and basically took control. Um, there was a man by the name of Antipater who in 47 B.C. was appointed by Julius Caesar to be the head of Rome, I mean the head of Israel, the king, and his son is somebody that we know well. His son's name was Herod, Herod the Great. Herod the Great was declared by the Roman Senate to be the king of the Jews around 40 B.C. You notice that we talked about this at Christmas time. He actually had the official title king of the Jews by the Roman Senate. They voted him in in 40 B.C. And of course, he planned, he carried out the building of a new temple in Jerusalem. But he was not particularly religious himself. He just looked at these as ways to, number one, build his own fame amongst the people, allow them to have another means to control him, to control them. And it really, he hated these Maccabees, all the people that were behind this revolt. He hated them all. And so he had them all killed. Herod, this was before the time of Jesus. He went and he, he systematically went through and everybody that was a part of the ruling class that they had conquered, he went and had them systematically killed. And in fact, once he found that, that his own wife was a descendant of some of them, he had her killed as well. And then he had his sons killed because, of course, they were part of it as well. He had them killed. Uh, that's how much he hated the, uh, the Maccabees and what they represented. And, uh, of course, Herod was the man on the throne when Jesus was born in a stable in Bethlehem. That takes you through 400 years. Now, what's the significance of all this? <laughs> that's a lot of history to just throw at you. But there are some significant things I want to just share because these are some things we read in the New Testament and we don't understand why they got there. The first is this. The synagogues. You know, Jesus always met in the synagogues. You know, Paul went and preached in the synagogues. Where did they come from? You ever wonder about that? The Old Testament doesn't set up the synagogue. There weren't any synagogues prescribed in the Old Testament. But what happened during this whole period of time the with the destruction of the temple by Babylon in 586 B.C., what happened was all these people were scattered all across these lands. And the only place that they, they, they could go to meet was they would say, we're going to go together and we're going to meet and talk about our faith. We're going to go meet and be taught the things that we learned back in, back in the old days that our, that our fathers told us about or, or whatever. And eventually these things developed into formal meeting houses and formal meeting times and they called them synagogues. They were times and places where local groups of Jews could get together to discuss their faith. And they all developed through this time. And even after the rebuilding of the temple under Herod, the synagogues continued because they had become over the last 400 years a way of life for the Jews. And uh, so that's why we see the synagogues mentioned a number of times in the New Testament. As I already said, the other thing that happened, which we see all the time in the New Testament and we don't really understand, are these Pharisees and Sadducees. These two factions developed over this time. And when Jesus starts talking to them and addressing the Pharisees and the Sadducees in some very direct language, right? He calls the Pharisees hypocrites. And, of course, we know the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. And there were a number of other things that he would, he would call out. He would call them out on a lot of things. Well, these people were, at the, by Jesus' day, they were people that figured out they had to work with each other. Again, they're like two political parties, right? Somehow they have to work with each other, but really they don't like each other. Right? They don't really want to shake hands across the aisle. They developed over the last hundred, several hundred years, and there wasn't a lot of goodwill between them. But they were nonetheless both influential groups in the day that Jesus lived. So those are some events. And, of course, Hanukkah, the birth of Hanukkah, happened through this time as well, all, all during this time. Now, what happened of significance prophetically? Let's, let's talk about that. Because... There's probably more prophecy that was fulfilled in those 400 silent years of the Bible than, than maybe had happened, you know, in the 400 years prior. Um, just quickly, we don't have time to, really, my time's my enemy tonight. But 
we're going we're gonna to just talk about them, and I'll, I'll give you the references. Uh, in Daniel chapter 8, there's a lot of these prophecies. The first prophecy that was fulfilled was the rise of the Greek Empire. Alexander the Great was very, in very great detail, prophesied in Daniel that he would come and he would do this. Uh, Daniel 8, verses 5 to 7, this is Daniel talking about a vision that he had, and he sees, he sees this as a he-goat. Uh, and in verse 5, he says, I was considering a he-goat came from the west and the face of the whole earth touched not the ground. The goat had a notable horn between his eyes. He came to the ram that had two horns, which represented the Medo-Persian Empire, which I had seen standing before the river and ran unto him in the fury of his power. And I saw him come close unto the ram. He was moved with collar against him, smote the ram, break his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him. But he cast him to the ground and was stamped upon him. There was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. Therefore the he-goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, for it came, for, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Now later in Daniel, it actually explains specifically what this is about. Here's what's interesting. Do you see all these prophecies that were fulfilled in, in the symbolism? First of all, we see Alexander the Great, he is, represents the great horn of the he-goat that we see in Daniel chapter 8. And at the height of his power, when he had just conquered the, all of the world, what happens? He dies. He dies quickly. He dies suddenly. He dies in the course of, I think, three days. He gets sick, and within, within like 72 hours, he's dead. And this man at 33 years old who seemed like invincible was gone. That didn't seem likely. Then what happens after that? Four kingdoms arise. His four generals come. That's prophesied right here in Daniel chapter 8. The four kingdoms come. They split up his kingdom. And so we see the rise of all of the, the empires that would come. And um, Daniel chapter 8, verses 9 through 11, talks about Antiochus Epiphanes, who we just talked about. The one who would come and desecrate the temple and force the Jews to do these terrible things. It says, out of one of them, in verse 9, out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, toward the pleasant land, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon him. And it talks about, in verse 11, he magnified himself to the prince of the host. By him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And, of course, there's a, there's a lot more we don't have time to talk about. But you want to know something. Do you know why liberal scholars don't believe in Daniel? They don't believe that Daniel is a, was a book written during the time of the Babylonian captivity. Do you know why? Because his prophecies are so detailed and exact and so completely fulfilled in what they see happen. They say Daniel had to have been written during the intertestamental period. Daniel had to have been written sometime after all these things happened and somebody wrote down all these events and, and put them in the book. Uh, liberal scholars don't believe Daniel's a valid book for the reason that the prophecies are too precise. And, uh, and so it just, to me, what does it do for us? It affirms the fact that God, God knew all of these things. He had them all lined up long before they ever happened. And this just affirms our faith in, in, in God doing these things. And, of course, the Roman Empire, if you remember, we won't turn to it, but Daniel chapter 2, we see Daniel, the king actually sees this vision of the, of the statue. And the top of the statue is gold, his head is gold, his mid part is silver, he has brass, and then he has iron feet. And um, the iron, and of course, it, it tells you what all these kingdoms are. The head represents the Babylonian king that Daniel was interpreting the dream for. Silver becomes the Medo Persians. Then we have the Greek Empire. And finally, the feet of iron become the Roman Empire. Uh, they're all prophesied there in Daniel. All these prophecies were fulfilled in the course of these 400 silent years of the Bible. Now, why does all this matter? Well, here's why it matters. I think a number of things we can take away from this. All of these things continually, when you look at them together and you look at them as a group, 
shows us how, how completely the stage was set for the Messiah to come on the scene. When we see Jesus, when we see the book of Matthew opening, and we see John the Baptist coming on the scene, and he is this voice crying in the wilderness, right? He's saying, every valley shall be, you know, uh, made straight. Every, every uh, I forget how it goes now. You know how it goes. <laughs> From the prophecies of Isaiah. And he, and he talks about these, these, these truths that, hey, I'm preparing a way for the Lord, and I'm here to, to call people to repentance. And we see the Messiah come on the scene. All of this had been 400 years in the making, 400 years of biblical silence, but political upheaval and political and, and, and societal changes that all pushed people's lives and the world towards a place where they were ready for the Messiah to come. And let me give you just a few, few reasons why uh, the, the stage was, was perfectly set for Jesus to come on the scene. First of all, as I said, Alexander the Great played a lot in this because what did he do? He caused the Greek language to be known by basically the whole world as we knew it at the time. Do you realize this was the first time since the Tower of Babel where pretty much the entire world knew a common language? There wasn't a time before the Tower of Babel. I mean, obviously, before everybody had different languages. <laughs> there wasn't really a time until then, until Alexander the Great came on the scene and said, everybody speak in Greek, and people became bilingual in a very short period of time. All of a sudden, Greek became the language everybody knew. They may not be their common tongue, but it was something they all could speak. And um, it became learned and accepted across the world. That had never happened before. Do you know also that this was the first time that the Old Testament, which was the vast majority written in Hebrew, there's a couple examples of Aramaic, but for the most part it was written in Hebrew. It was written for the Hebrews. It was a, it was a Jewish Bible. Nobody else knew about it. It was you know, specific to them. All of a sudden in this course of time, which we didn't talk about, around 270 B.C., the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. It was known as the Septuagint. All of the Old Testament now was in a language that was understood by the vast majority of the known world. And you know that this Septuagint, this Greek translation of the Old Testament, which became known as the Septuagint, almost all of the New Testament references and all of the references that Jesus ever quoted the Old Testament in, you know he quoted in Greek? He quoted from that Greek version of the Old Testament. You know, why did he do that? All of a sudden now the Bible was accessible. God's truth now became available, not just to the Jews, but to everyone, because the Messiah would become available to the whole world as well. It's, a, it's amazing when you begin to think about it. What else set the stage for the Messiah to come? They now had a common language. They had the Bible in that common language. And now the Romans were in charge. And you know one of the great things that the Romans brought to the world at large, and we still even have evidence of it today, are the great Roman roads. The Romans built, they loved to build roads. I don't know what they, you know, why, why they loved to build them so much, but they did. They built roads everywhere. And you know the saying we even have today, all, all roads lead to, all other roads lead to Rome. And there was a reason. That was a way that they, that goes clear back to this time period. They built roads so that people could get to and from Rome quickly. Well, you know what? Roads that were well-kept and secure and well-maintained made people accessible to different parts of the world very quickly. When Paul and the other apostles and the early church began and they had this great message to proclaim and Jesus says, go ye into all the world, you know what he was saying? Go take the road. This is, that's how they went from place to place. They took these Roman roads and they went to these places to share Christ with others. The Roman roads made it so much easier to access the world at large, something that wasn't true before this time. And Roman authority, even though we say, boy, the Romans weren't always real nice to the Christians, absolutely true, but Roman authority provided a sense of order and peace in the world that had not been seen before this time either. In fact, from the time of 27 B.C., which was, what, 25 years before Christ, to 180 A.D., which was un after the early church was 
really well established. I just want you to think about this time period, about a 200-year period of time from the time Christ was born until the early church was established. It's known as a time in secular history books as the Pax Romana. Anybody hear that? Remember that from time? It's called the Peace of Rome. It's a 200-year period of time, which up until this point in history had never happened. Here's what the secular historians say about this. The Pax Romana is said to have been a miracle because prior to it there had never been peace for so many centuries in a given period of history. Worldwide, over this 200 years, there were virtually no wars. There were virtually no fightings between countries. Roman had, Romans had conquered the world, other than their new conquest that they were out taking over. The whole Roman world, which was the, pretty much the known world at the time, they had peace in this area. Now, doesn't that seem like a perfect place to be able to go and share the gospel, <laughs> to go and establish the church? God had set this up in a special way. He had prepared the governments. He had prepared the language. He had prepared his word. And he prepared the whole world for the stage that the Messiah could come, Jesus could come and show who he was and show that he was there for the world in a way that any other point in history would have not ever have given the same impact. Here's what one writer said. I'm just going to tie it up with this as we, as we close. Romans and Greeks were drawn from their mythologies toward the Hebrew scriptures, now easily accessible in Greek or Latin. In other words, the Romans and Greeks by this period, they were getting tired of the gods that they were serving. They were finding them to be empty. The Jews, however, were despondent. Once again, they were conquered, oppressed, and polluted. So the Jewish people continued to feel oppressed. Hope was running low. Faith was even lower. They were convinced now, the Jews, that the only thing that could save them and their faith was the appearance of the Messiah. Well... Isn't that when they saw Jesus? Isn't this what they wanted him to be? The one that would rise up and be that conquering Messiah? This is what they were looking for. The Romans had built roads to aid the spread of the gospel. That's, you know, quote unquote. <laughs> Everyone understood this common language, Koine Greek, and there was a fair amount of peace and freedom to travel, which further aided the dissemination of the gospel. You know, when you think about, and this is just a real quick overview, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things that I could talk about uh, that you look at miracle after miracle that happened during this time period, and you realize, wow, God might have been silent in Scripture, but he was busy in the world. <laughs> he was busy fulfilling his prophecies. He was busy preparing a place for his son to come so that that message could be spread could be sent to the broadest amount of people in the shortest amount of time. And as always, God knows exactly what he's doing. Everything's in his hands. He's in control. So when we sit and think, God's silent. Where's God in my life? Realize God's still at work. <laughs> God's still in control. And you don't know what he might be setting the stage for in your life or in the, in the world that you're about to, to experience through him. So let's keep that faith and realize that we can take hope from what God's done, even in those silent years. So our time's up, so let's have a word of prayer, and, uh, and we'll close together. Lord, we do thank you. We thank you that even in times that we think you're silent, that you're still at work, that you're still moving, that you're still in control. We thank you how you set the stage and coordinated all of these events ultimately for your honor and glory, so that Christ could be proclaimed, that the church could be established, and that that message of hope and redemption through him could be known to the ancient world and ultimately found in us here today. We thank you for that and pray that you'd help us to be faithful as we share it with others in the week ahead. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.